Welcome to Plowing Through Brexit, Farmers Guardian's Brexit podcast. Hello and welcome to the very first Farmers Guardian Plowing Through Brexit podcast with me, Will Evans. And me, Abby Kay. Today we're delighted to have two great guests with us. Our first is Nick Van Westenholtz, who's the Director of EU Exit and International Trade for the National Farmers Union. Hi, Nick. Hello. And Neil Parrish, who's the Conservative Member of Parliament for Tiverton and Honiton and Chair of the Commons EFRA Committee. Hi, Neil. Good morning. Now, welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. And it is fair to say that it has been quite the week in Parliament, hasn't it? Indeed it has. <laughs> and, it hasn't, and it hasn't ended yet. No. <laughs> yes, no. Yes. It's just beginning. Yeah. yeah. It's only Thursday. Um, but there's only one place we can realistically start here, isn't there? And that's um, that the Prime Minister has survived the night, but she's lost the confidence of almost 40% of her MPs. I know you voted for her, Neil, but what, what's the feeling in Parliament now? Do you think Labour will launch their own vote of no confidence in the government? Or are we just going to have more rebels grabbing the mace? What do you reckon? Will we see you doing that anytime soon? Well, I might grab the mace with my teeth. We're going to have to do something different <laughs> than what's going on at the moment. But um, but to be serious, yeah, I mean, the Prime Minister has survived. Um, I think probably it's been a salutary lesson for her because I very much supported her as Prime Minister. But it was no good to bring this deal onto the floor of the House while we didn't have the backing of the DUP. There was no chance of it going through. And so, therefore, you know, she's made that commitment before she comes back um, to again with it that we will have the DUP on side or it's not coming back in its present form at all. So, I mean, I think, you know, members of parliament will settle down. I mean, they, some of them are more upset than others. Um, I just thought it was a crazy time to change prime minister when, you know, we've only got to the 29th of March. We got this, you know, get by the deadline of 21st of January. Um, so as far as I was concerned, uh, she's a very able lady. Um, I think she was slightly misguided to get herself into this position. Uh, but however, I think most MPs will now settle down. She can't be challenged under our rules now for at least another 12 months. And so that really does buy her time to get the deal and get the country sorted out and stop the Conservative Party, hopefully, looking at our navels instead of getting on with running the country there's there's so much uncertainty around at the moment nick how do farmers deal with this whilst trying to run a business like how how do we plan for a month down the road let alone a year yeah i mean it's you know it's it's really unsatisfactory and Mm -hmm. i mean you know we're now nearly in christmas and the future looks more uncertain than it has for um uh for many many months and um it's really no good for well for any businesses uh, uh farm businesses or, or other businesses within within the economy of course of course you know the the problem for farmers is that unlike uh other other sectors of the economy who are beginning to plan for contingencies around no deal and trying to mitigate all this uncertainty you know they can't up sticks and you know put people in uh, in offices in in european mainland or, or wherever uh you know we we're here we're on the ground in the uk and we've um, we've got to stay put whatever happens so um i, I think it's in, you know it's important to say that farmers will carry on uh, mm-hmm. as best they can they're, they're they're not sort of um uh um, you know, throwing their, their the towel in or throwing their hands up. Um, actually, um, I think they're you know a resilient bunch by and large, and um, uh, uh, will excuse the pun, but plow on regardless. Um, <laughs> but you know, actually, actually, where 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 we are now, um, you know, there, there's just some very clear um, decisions that need to be made. You know, it's either no deal on the one hand, it's a deal between the EU and the UK, and 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 let's not miss that point you know we need the eu to agree this as well so Mm. all the fancy ideas of going back and having x y and z well if the eu doesn't agree it when then then it's no deal coming quickly Mm. um and then all of the other ideas around delaying things postponing things having a second referendum they're all very timely very difficult to do as well so um you know uh uh, let's uh let's urge both the uh, the uk and the eu governments to um uh, put their heads together act like grown-ups and uh, get this sorted Absolutely. Do we do we think the deal, the risk of a no deal, has increased because of events over the past couple of days? What are we thinking? Yeah, definitely oh. increased. And there's no doubt about that, in my view. Mm. I mean, I think 
I, I think it's a good question because there, there seems to be people saying, oh, no, now that no, the chance of no deal has, has decreased and Parliament won't allow it. Look, you know, there's a really, interest, there's a really important thing to note here that uh, in the absence of any other agreement uh, or any other um, path for which there's a majority in Parliament, then no deal happens. It happens by default. It's no good Parliament just saying, well, we don't want it to happen. Mm. If they don't want it to happen, they've got to come up with an alternative and probably one which the EU uh, buys into as well. Mm. And yeah. that point that Nick's making is, 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 is one of the reasons why probably we will finally get a deal, because my colleagues in the end, they're not going to get all get what they want. And so therefore they've got to decide, you know, if they, because they can't guarantee it'll be driven to a no deal. It might be, you know, we, we, we try and revoke Article 50 and do all sorts of strange things. So, you know, we have got to get together. And, and this is why I'm saying to my own party, for goodness me, we've got different views on either side but a deal with the EU is much better than a no deal because we are making preparations. I've been over to death for this morning. You know, I think we can trade um, with an, in a no deal situation as a third country. But, of course, if you started to see 70% tariffs um, mm. that go on our products, um, it would be pointless in trying to, to export because it just wouldn't be economic. Speaking, I mean, you spoke about the deal earlier, Neil, that the Prime Minister's got. Um, when is that actually going to come back to Parliament? for a vote and is, is it going to pass when it does? Last night she was talking about sort of January, um, not exactly when in January, but I imagine before the, the 21st of January. I also think she also said quite clearly that she would sort of, she would only bring it back if she had the support of the DUP because then she had a fighting chance of getting it through. So, I mean, it largely depends on that because, you see, it's the arithmetic. It doesn't matter whether you agree with the DUP or not. Um, the backstop, the, you know, the United Kingdom, all of these things that are so so important, um, if we don't get those votes on the side, um, then there is no chance of it going through. And so that's why it's so imperative uh, to do this. I mean, this is what I wanted her to do uh, two or three weeks ago, rather than sort of push the vote right to the last minute and then withdraw it. But, you know, as they say in politics, we are where we are. <laughs> so let's move on, um, look positively at it, because... As far as I'm concerned, um, I will have to hold my nose on some of the some of the uh, parts of the deal which I don't like in order to get a a deal. But it's just you know the arithmetic of, of Parliament is so tight um, mm. that it's almost impossible to call. Okay, okay. One thing um, that I wanted to ask about, and it's something that as a livestock farmer is increasingly concerning me, and that's food import standards post Brexit. Uh, Michael Gove has said on record categorically that import standards will not be lower but George East has told you the government could recognise equivalence without legislating for identical standards during DEFRA questions recently Neil what did you think of his answer? It's still not strong enough and so therefore I am putting down even some more amendments as we as we speak where I'm trying to get the government to be mandated mm. when it goes forward to do trade deals so that you know they have to go before parliament before, like the senate in America uh, before they do a trade deal and then as they come to sign the trade deal they've got to come back with it and said what they've actually agreed because mm. otherwise we will export our you know our industry um, if we import foods that don't meet those standards also the point i made in my question the other week was that worldwide animal welfare standards you're going to reduce them if you reduce our standards of imports because you know you'll put our higher standard of welfare out of business um farmers and you will import food that's not been and animal welfare will suffer across globally and i think you know we've got to try and wake up to the situation it's not just again it's about global trade and if you're going to start bringing in low quality then you you know we will pay the price but so will so will animal welfare and animals pay the price too yeah, yeah, Nick. Nick, that must be something that the NFU are really concerned about too. Do you think the government is actually listening to you and Neil on this, on getting something into statute, or are they just happy to to let it be for the time being? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think our concern is that we've heard warm words, particularly from Michael Gove, as, as Will said, then, but um, very little kind of concrete to back it up. Um, and there have been amendments already put forward to the Ag Bill that haven't been accepted around it. Neil's put some very interesting ones forward and, and talked then about potentially new ones. Um, I mean, you know, I, I think 
we appreciate it's not the most straightforward thing to legislate about. Um, and so you have to accept there might need to be a sort of uh, uh, a proper thought through common sense discussion about how you can legislate around this to to achieve what we all want. Um, and, and the point Neil made there about uh, requiring greater parliamentary oversight of trade deals is a, is a really important one. It's something we, we argued for uh, on the trade bill, which is going through Parliament at the moment, that you know there actually needs to be a requirement for Parliament to sort of sign these things off, which there are uh, there isn't uh, going to be uh, at the moment. So, so that's important. But you know the specific issue here about uh, the standards to which food has been produced overseas, which is then imported into the UK, um, is what's really exercising us. And um, I, I think what we really need to understand is you know chapter and verse on how government intends to um, to deal with this. If it can't do it for legislation for, for whatever reasons, then what other tools are at its disposal? Uh, and I think at the moment we're just seeing very little detail beyond uh, just a sort of top line warm words from government saying, oh, don't worry, they've they've got it in hand. So we really need to, to understand understand the details and have a have a proper transparent detailed um, kind of policy statement and debate uh, around it. Well, everyone can look at FG's special investigation into production standards abroad if they are interested in this. After that <laughs> in there. Sorry. <laughs> yes, it's so, it, it is so important to get, get something in legislation. I'm hoping that the Lords will pick up some of these amendments as well when it goes into the Lords, because um, we have got, it doesn't matter whether it's a trade bill or whether it's an agriculture bill, somewhere it's got to be laid down clearly in statute what the government has to do when it negotiates a trade deal. Otherwise, you know, we will trade away um, our animal welfare standards and we must not do that. Definitely. Now then, uh, the other day during a BBC Radio 5 live phone-in, uh, a caller actually fell asleep while listening to other guests talking about Brexit. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think, I think there is a definite, there's a definite Brexit fatigue setting in countrywide, isn't there? And I've, I've heard a lot of farmers say they're sick of hearing about it. Nick, how do we keep them engaged? Because it's vital that we keep our eyes wide open right now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and you know, I, I, uh, I appreciate that people uh, out there getting a bit kind of fed up with, uh, with all of this. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, understand, I understand why. And I think in a way we, we need to kind of avoid, avoid ramming it down people's throats all the time and um and try and be sort of almost i guess selective uh just make sure that um you know we're not interfering with their day job um and, and in fact that we're not we're not forgetting our day job as well there's all yeah. sorts of really critical things going on in in the farming sector which need uh, addressing and looking at and organizations like the nfu to be working hard on and, and let's you know not forget that um those are priorities as well um, but you know, at the same time, uh, we need to, to to a make sure people understand we are on the case and that these things are important, and uh, we're trying our best to, to 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 resolve them in the best way. And that b particularly around, for example, some of the uh, potential impacts of a no deal scenario, um, that farmers are aware of of, of what's going on um, and that they can try and prepare as best they can accordingly. Hopefully, we'll avoid that. We won't need all of that. But um, it does make me nervous a bit that that with uh, with this so-called Brexit fatigue, that the farmers are actually um, uh, not going to sit up and take notice mm. of um, some of the very immediate and potentially uh, enormously um, impactful uh, implications for their for their farm businesses. So um, it's a it is a tough one. Um, we try and put out as much as information as we can through our normal sort of communication channel, channels at the NFU and put it on our website, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, I am, I am uh, uh, aware that stuffing this down people's throats endlessly day after day is uh, potentially counterproductive as, uh, as well. So mm. it's, a, it's a fine balance. Definitely. What, what, what would you say, Neil? How do we make sure that people don't get Brexit fatigue? Yeah, I think Nick's you know hit the nail on the head. It's because the trouble is we're arguing all the time about the same subject, you know, inside the single market, outside the customs union, all of these things, all to do with trade. Now, naturally, they're interesting when you talk about them the first time, but five hundred times people are absolutely fed up with it. So you know, so but 
But, you know, in there, in the end, if we don't get this deal right, we will not be as well off when we leave the EU as we are now. And so, mm. therefore, you know, for me, not only um, with my sort of farming hat on and others, but my political hat on, because, you see, people will, will say, yes, they're fatigued, and, yeah, they'll get on with it, do it, sign it, you know, get, get out. Well, that's fine until they're worse off, you see. Yeah. And then they won't blame themselves. They'll just blame us as politicians for saying, well, you told us it was all be better and it's not it's no. well um and you can't blame people for voting because they vote for what they choose to vote for and we tell them it's all going to be wonderful anyway don't we as politicians so so that's the issue for me is that we've got to get it right but i think at some stage we just have to now you know come together do it and stop talking about it because i mean i mean i even my wife and i you know i mean you hear the news you know and you hear listen to radio four in the morning and there's only only so much you can stomach isn't there really and then you, <laughs> then you turn it off um and if you think i mean i'm a politician so if you think i've got to that stage where where the, where is the rest of the public they're probably completely mad about it you know completely mm-hmm. had enough but we will have to you know get that deal in order to sort of settle it down um and then perhaps we can get on and talk about something else that really you know <laughs> this does really matter but other things that matter are education health and, and farming and yeah. food and all these things let's let's try and move on if we can and i mm. just hope that at some stage parliament you know will come to an agreement and we, we, we will realize that neil i hope you're ready for uh, the flack because i think it's coming but um <laughs> yeah. i think we're gonna have to leave it there for today jen so we could talk about this all day and thank you both very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and talk to us today. And to everyone listening, thank you. And keep your eyes peeled for the next Farmers Guardian Plowing Through Brexit podcast, which will be out next month. Both myself and Abby would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a very happy and healthy 2019.